church family, happy Thanksgiving week. I hope that since we're on the other side of Thanksgiving, hopefully you got some time off, ate some good food, were able to hang out with family or whatever you were doing. Just hope that it was an awesome Thanksgiving time together. We are thankful to have you here as we're continuing our series today that we opened up with last Sunday. And that series is called Reclamation Project, where we're seeing how God uses imperfect people to accomplish his purpose. And we're going to continue with that today. In addition, we're going to continue to be a people that share in the good news of Jesus and to share our life as well. So for sharing in the good news today, we're going to be doing that through the the music that we sing and declare those truths. We're also going to be doing that through studying the scripture together and continuing this study of Reclamation Project. In addition, let me share with you a couple ways that we can be people that share life together as well. One of the best ways to share life is if you have any questions about our church family or how you can get connected, whether that's through a small group or serving, or maybe you just want to know more about your next steps with Jesus, I would encourage you to please email us at info at goodlifefl.com, info at goodlifefl.com, or you can visit our website, goodlifefl.com. In addition to that, you can always find us on social media. We're on Facebook as well as Instagram. So happy Thanksgiving, church family. Let's go ahead and dive in with worship. my 
you were writing a story of unusual greatness, somebody who did something amazing, somebody who did something heroic, somebody who saved the world, somebody who rescued some people, like if you had to write a story of unusual greatness, who would be the star? Well, you could choose a superhero, but don't we have enough superhero movies? Like now there's superhero movies come out. I've never heard of the superheroes before, but they're getting movies now. So we probably have enough superhero movies, don't we? But the stories that really resonate with us sometimes are the people who had greatness in them, but they never knew it. They were born in obscurity, like the heir to the throne, was living a life of complete obscurity, but he finds out he was always intended to be great, and because of the story unfolding, his greatness comes out of him. Like Those are the stories that resonate with us because there's a part of us that somewhere deep down, we hope there's some greatness in us as well. But when we look in the mirror every single day, that's not necessarily what we always see. When we look back at our past, greatness would not be the word we would use to describe our track record to this point. And as we look forward, and as we look in the mirror, and as we look forward, there are times we go, I'm not sure I'm meant for a great story. That when we look in the mirror and we see who we are, and we look to our past and we see who we are, we look at our lives and to a certain extent we decide I think I'm going to have a quiet legacy that I'm leaving behind. I'm not meant for greatness. Other people are, but that's just not me. See, here's the thing. Somewhere along the line, we have believed that personal greatness is a prerequisite for a great story and a great legacy. But that's the question that I want to wrestle with today. Is personal greatness a requirement for a great legacy? See, here's the thing. We never get to decide whether we're going to leave a legacy or not. If you are breathing air right now, you're going to leave a legacy. There's somebody who's watching your life. There's somebody who's being shaped and molded by who you are and by what you do. You're going to leave a legacy. The question is, what kind of legacy are you going to leave? The stories we love tell us that great people leave great legacies, but we don't look in the mirror and see greatness. Could we be wrong? Is greatness maybe not a requirement for a legacy? That's great. We're in the midst of a series called Reclamation Projects. We're a couple weeks into it, sort of, because we've looked at a couple different lives so far. We've looked at the life of Peter, where Peter had denied even knowing Jesus, this moment where he wrecked everything, and he became this reclamation project of Jesus still using him to do great things. Even though he crashed it all in that moment, Jesus is on trial for his life. Peter denies even knowing who Jesus is, right? So we have Peter, and then last week, We looked at Thomas, this sort of unknown disciple in three of the Gospels, and yet in the Gospel of John, John leans into Thomas' story, and we see that doubting Thomas, as we remember him, actually becomes faithful Thomas, who carries the good news as far as India. We looked at two lives there that really were lives that had been wrecked by bad moments and lives that needed to be redeemed and still used in God's great story. And I've I believe we see God delight in telling those kind of stories because they're there in Scripture over and over and over again. But are those the only kind of reclamation stories that God tells, the only type of reclamation projects that God dives into? We're going to look at a type of story today, a type of hero today who never would have seen greatness in him. There's nothing in his past to indicate greatness. There's nothing in his story to indicate greatness. And yet God uses him in big ways. We're going to be in the book of Judges today. And it's a book maybe some of you aren't very familiar with, but we're diving into the book of Judges. It lives right between Joshua and Ruth. First five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And and Judges covers the time between the conquering of the promised land and the coming of the kings, between the time when the people of Israel conquered the land God had promised to them and the coming of the monarchies of Saul and David and Solomon. It lives in that sort of time frame. But it's a dark time in Israel's history, and it's a time when God's people are tumbling into a sin cycle. I'm going to put the cycle on the screen. We're going to talk through it for a second. In the book of Judges, over and over and over again, the exact same story framework is revisited. You start with Israel sinning and denying God. God's done great things for them, given them the promised land, delivered them from Egypt, and they come into the promised land, and yet here, Israel starts sinning, they start defying God, they start denying God. So God gives them over to an oppressed, to be oppressed by a stronger people. That's the second step. And then in their oppression, in their suffering, Israel cries out to be rescued. 
They repent and they cry out to God for a rescue. That's the third step. The fourth step is God sends a judge. God sends a hero. God sends somebody to rescue his people and set them free. And then the fifth step is that as long as that judge, that hero lives, the people of Israel are good. But as soon as they die, they fall back into the exact same cycle. There are 15 different judges listed in the book of Judges. So 15 different times the people of Israel reached the end of their rope because they'd sinned against God and they were living in oppression and they cry out to God and God raises up a judge. God raises up a hero to rescue them and set them free. This is where you find people like Samuel. Samuel, born for greatness. He's this miracle child that that, that his mother Hannah promises back to God, and he's this incredibly powerful religious leader for the people of Israel. But from his conception, he seems marked for greatness. It's in the book of Judges that you find Samson, who from his birth is prophesied to be this man of might and strength that God is going to use to rescue his people. Samson, you see greatness in Samson from the very get-go. And then in the midst of those people, you find a guy by the name of Gideon. And when Gideon's time on the stage comes, Gideon, things aren't going well in Gideon's life or in the life of Gideon's people. Will you join me in Judges chapter 6, verse 1, where it says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian for seven years. Jumping down to verse 6, And Israel was brought very low by Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Here you see this cycle of sin happening. Up to this point, it's happened four other times before this. Hundreds of years have passed where the people of Israel have gone through this cycle of sin. Everything's good. The people start to rebel. God gives them over to oppression. They cry out for rescue. God raises up a judge. The judge leads them to victory and freedom. And then everything's good as long as the judge lives. So that's gone on several, several times. This is like the fourth or fifth time that the people of Israel have reached the end of their rope and they've cried out to God for help. To this point, the people have been oppressed and conquered by the Moabites, Ammonites, Amalekites, and Canaanites, right? There's a lot of suffering that has happened in the people of Israel's lives to this point. And now the new bully on the block is Midian. And Midian is coming in and oppressing them. And God had allowed this to happen as a means of punishment, as a means of correction, as a means of bringing the people of Israel to the end of their rope so they would turn their hearts back to him. So when Israel cried out in verses 7 through 10, uh, God sends them a prophet, unnamed prophet, but prophets are people who speak for God. They speak on his behalf. They bring the word of the Lord to the Lord's people. And so the prophet spoke and he said, I... God speaking through him basically says, I am the Lord your God. I am the God who led you out of captivity in Egypt. I am the God who delivered unto you the promised land. Guys, you don't have to fear the gods of your oppressors. You don't have to fear the gods of the Midianites. But he says this, the Lord says, know this, you've not obeyed my voice. Know this, your hearts are far from me. You're worshiping Baal and you're worshiping Asherah. You're worshiping these pagan gods of your pagan neighbors. You've turned your back on me. I'm going to send deliverance, but not so you can be free, so that you can come home. He says, I can't believe you've fallen into the cycle of sin again, but you have. And it's in this moment that Gideon steps onto the stage. It's probably not the story you and I would have written, but it's a powerful story nonetheless. Look at verse 11 where it says, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, that's not Oprah, but Ophrah, okay, which belonged to Joath the Abazite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian, into this chaos and suffering that the people of Israel are experiencing, God sends an angel, a messenger, to carry a word from God to God's people. Now, that angel does not show up to some great leader. 
who's plotting and planning and raising up an army to lead God's people to freedom. That's not who Gideon is. The angel does not come to some religious leader whose heart longs for the things of God, who is going to call God's people back to repentance. That's not who Gideon is. He comes to a guy named Gideon who has nothing great about him. Now, from a 21st century perspective, sometimes we read paragraphs like we just read, and a lot is missed to us. From our modern perspective, we're not seeing all that's happening there. So let me unpack it a little bit. Was there greatness in Gideon? Like, did Gideon possess any personal greatness? Let's walk through three things that tell us, no, he doesn't. The first is this. Gideon is doing grunt work. Gideon is out there threshing the wheat, taking the stalks of wheat and threshing it so you can get the good parts out. Okay, so he's doing grunt work. If you're the leader, if you're in control, if you're somebody who's like highly respected and the leader of multiple people, you're not the one out threshing the wheat. You've got other people to thresh the wheat for you. So Gideon is like low on, low on the ladder of success if he's the one threshing the wheat. Second thing is this. He's doing grunt work in hiding. Gideon is hiding while he's doing that grunt work. How do I know that? Because it th- says he was threshing the wheat in the wine press. Now, the wine press would have been this indented area either in the earth or inside of an object, right, where you went in there to press down the grapes to get the wine out of them, to get the juice out of them. And you don't thresh wheat in a wine press, and the only reason you do it is because you're hiding your wheat from your oppressors. The analogy is this. If you're a student in school, you eat lunch in the cafeteria. Unless you know the bullies are going to steal your lunch, then you find the janitor's closet to hide so you can eat your lunch without the bully stealing your lunch. If you're threshing your wheat in the wine press, you're afraid the bullies are going to come and take your wheat. That's what's happening here. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is this. Gideon is grumbling while he's doing his grunt work. He's sitting there going, oh, God? God wants to do something great? Where is God? Where is this God that, that, that our forefathers talked about all the great things he did? Where is he today? Why am I threshing the wheat in the wine press, fearful that the bullies are going to come take our food? Where is this great God? I don't see him. Gideon is grumbling because he looked at his life and he looked at his country. And instead of having a broken heart of repentance for the sins that his people had committed against God, Gideon is shaking his fist at God going, how dare you let this happen to us? Man, sometimes I look around at what's happening in our world, and I know there's some part of our heart sometimes that goes, God, where have you gone? And yet when I look at the pattern of human behavior, man, Is it any wonder that God has given us over to some things? Because we have turned our back on him. This is an ancient story with very timely application to our current culture and our current culture and our current country. Gideon looked at his country. Gideon looked at his task. Gideon looked what was before him. And when we look at Gideon, does any of that look like greatness? Does any of this look like the hero that you and I would write? He's grumbling to the to the angel, and the angel says to him, it's this interesting phrase, he says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. He's the least, like he's he's, he's low on the totem pole, right? Because he's the one threshing the wheat in the wine press. He's hiding from the bullies, so there's nothing strong about him, and he's grumbling all the way. And yet the angel says to him and greets him, O mighty man of valor. If we took a picture of you, the moment you get out of bed, okay, what would we think? Would, would, would we think the same thing about you in that picture as we see you today? Like now you're all cleaned up. You guys are looking sharp, right? You're looking like you have on like, oh, we can wear our sweaters today, right? This is sweater day. You're able to put that on and come out. You guys are looking great. But did you look that way an hour ago, right? When you crawl out of bed and there's crusties in your eye, bed head all over the place, crease lines across your face. Is that the moment, like, like the band goes into hail to the chief, he's the chief, he needs his hailing, right? Like, is that the moment when you're greeted with greatness when you roll out of bed? No, none of us feel that way when we're rolling out of bed. That's where Gideon was. Gideon, looking at his worst, at the lowest he could possibly be, grumbling about it the entire way, the angel says, greetings, O mighty man of valor. There's nothing great about him, and yet he is greeted as if there is. Why is that? Look at verse 14. It says, the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? 
Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. The Lord said, Gideon, go in this might of yours. Now, we've already said there's nothing mighty or great about him. He's doing grunt work, menial labor, in hiding from the bullies, and whining and complaining the whole way. And yet God looks at him and says, hey, mighty man of valor, go in this might of yours. Gideon, God looks at Gideon and he says, I'm sending you. I'm sending you to do something great. Use this strength that you have that no one else can see. And I want you to save the nation of Israel from the clutches of Midian. The Lord is telling Gideon, I see you right here at your worst. And yet I'm calling you to something great. I'm calling you to be a part of something amazing. The person Gideon saw in the mirror couldn't possibly grasp and believe that he could be a part of anything great with God. And we can see from our perspective that there's nothing great about him. So Gideon hears the invitation, and all he can see is his part in the plan. All he can see is the weakness that he brings to the equation. Gideon looks at the angel and says, I am the least in my father's house, and our clan is the least in our tribe. So like of the tribe of Manasseh, which is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, this is where Gideon came from. They'd be like his family tree, right? So within within this tribe, he's in the weakest clan, and he's the lowest of his family within that clan. If you were picking somebody in Israel to save Israel, Gideon would have been the very last one you and I would have ever chosen. And when Gideon heard the call of God on his life, Gideon said, I can't be a part of that. I'm the least. Have you ever looked at something in your life and had that same feeling? Looked at some situation, some some step in your life journey and had the reaction in your heart and in your mind, maybe for a moment and maybe for months. I can't do that. I'm the least. You ever felt that in like trying to accomplish a new task? You don't have what it takes to do this, that, or the other. You don't have what it takes to step into that new job, that new position, that new role. You've been dating somebody for a while, but you're not sure you have what it takes to step into marriage. You're married, but you're not sure you have what it takes to step into having children. Maybe you have kids, but now, you know, kids and all these family connections, tragedy comes into your life, and you're looking at that tragedy, and you go, I don't know that I have what it takes to to lead my family and to love my family through this tragedy. Or maybe you're reaching that age where you're dealing with aging parents and you're going, I'm I'm not ready for this season of life. I don't have what it takes. I'm the least. I could go on probably through dozens and dozens and dozens of things you and I face that sometimes we don't feel equal to, don't we? Here's the thing. If we struggle to fulfill earthly roles, is it any wonder we wrestle with God's eternal mission? We look at temporal, human-centric, earth bound things and go, I'm not sure I have what it takes. Is it any wonder when we look at God's call to reach our neighbors and the nations with the good news for us to live for him that we kind of go, I'm the least. Here's the reality that I want us to hear today. We're right. We are the least. In every circumstance, the longer I live, the more I realize I don't have what it takes. Every Sunday morning when I carry these notes up up to the stage and I sit down, I know I don't have what it takes to share this message with you. When I think about loving my wife well and leading my children well, I look at those situations, and more and more, the longer I live, the more I realize I don't have what it takes to do those things well and do them the way they're supposed to be done. I don't have what it takes. When I feel like I'm the least, I think in reality I'm totally right. We are one of billions of humans who have ever lived. We are a vapor who is here for a moment and gone. We are the least. And I'm going to put to you, guys, that's the key. Look at verse 16. The Lord said to Gideon, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midians as one man. Do you see the difference? The task is bigger than Gideon. And Gideon looked at the task, and he said, who am I to do this, God? I am in the weakest clan, and I'm the least of that clan. I am the least, and I don't have what it takes. And God goes, you're exactly right. But what you don't understand, Gideon, is that I will be with you. 
in what I've called you to do. God's not telling Gideon, Gideon, I have searched high and low. I have reviewed all the resumes and the references. Out of every human on the planet at this point, you are the superhuman who can accomplish my super plan. That's not what God is saying. But sometimes that's how we feel, isn't it? But when God calls us to do something, we go, well, then he must think I have what it takes to do this. Complete wrong reading of the invitation. Gideon was the least in his clan and family, but that didn't matter because God was with him. The same thing is true with you as well. If you are in Christ, if you have been saved, if you have said, I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and you have waved the white flag and surrendered to his call to salvation, then the the same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in you and the Holy Spirit indwelling you. And if that's the case, I can say with confidence, God is with you every bit as much, if not more, than God was with Gideon in this moment. And God will never lead you to a place that he will not sustain you. God will never send you down a path that he has not already seen the end of. When we define our potential by our perspective, we miss the most important part of the equation, is that God is with us. Do you believe that? Let me ask it a little bit differently. Does your life and your obedience look like you believe that? If you believe that, then the, then the reaction to that belief, that's not an intellectual thing. You can't go, I believe that God is with me, and then do nothing about it. Because that's the surest sign that you don't actually believe it. Your belief is revealed not in what you will say or what you will think. Your belief is revealed in what you will do. If you believe that God is with you, then are you willing to step off the sideline and be a part of doing great things for him? Let's keep going with Gideon and understand what that looks like in our life. In verses 17 through 35, uh, Gideon uh, hears this promise of God being with him. He begins to like sort of dip his toe into it. He doesn't immediately like grab a sword and start running at the Midianite army. He just dips his toe in the water, and he does an act of obedience. He goes out and he tears down what's called an Asherah pole. One of the gods of the pagan people around them is a god named Asherah. And they had a pole, picture a totem pole, right, that people would be worshiping at or giving sacrifices to. And under the cover of night, Gideon goes out, pulls it down. And he takes what's left of that pole and he builds an altar and he offers a sacrifice to God there. And when the people wake up the next morning, the, his, his neighbors and his countrymen, when they, when they wake up the next morning and they see the Asherah pole is torn down, they're mad at Gideon because Gideon has done something. That was the thing they were worshiping. They weren't worshiping God anymore. They were worshiping Asherah like they're conquering people, the Midianites. And so they weren't happy with Gideon for doing this. And you know who else wasn't happy? The Midianites. And the Midianites started to, started to amass their army and come toward them to put these people that they had conquered back under their thumb. And this threat of the Midianite army coming to get him prompted Gideon to go, did God really say that? Is that really what God wants me to do? Look at verse 36. It says, then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, Behold, I am laying out a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. And if there is dew on the fleece alone and it's dry on all of the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and he squeezed out the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. So if you were to take a towel, freshly washed, freshly folded towel, and put it out in your yard today, tonight, and you get up the next morning, and the towel is soaking wet, and the ground is bone dry. That'd be an odd thing in Florida, right? How often, if you park outside, make my wife gets the garage, so she doesn't have to deal with this. She's my wife. She gets the garage. My car's outside. So when I go outside, there's dew on the car, and you've got to deal with that, and you're driving toward the sun, and you can't quite get all the dew off, and it's blinding, right? You guys know what dew is, okay? If you put a towel out on the ground, and you left it out on a dewy morning, the towel soaked and the ground is bone dry. That'd be remarkable, wouldn't it? Gideon puts out a fleece, puts out a towel. It's basically an animal skin, but he puts out something, and it was true. You can't explain that. Something amazing happened. And so Gideon goes, awesome, God. Thanks for the confirmation. Come on, Israel. Let's go. Is that what happens? Nope. He tries again. Look at verse 39. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me, but let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. 
please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and all of the ground there was dew. So he did the opposite, and it came true. Soaking wet ground, if you walked outside to walk the dog in your socks, you would have walked back in with soaked socks. And yet somewhere in the midst of all that moisture is a bone dry towel right in the middle of your yard. Pretty cool, pretty remarkable, right? You ever heard somebody talk about, you know, I'm not sure if God's calling me to do this or other. I'm putting out a fleece. I'm putting out a fleece to see if God wants me to do this. And we kind of go, oh yeah, I've heard that story. There's Gideon in the fleece. All right, maybe we should put out fleeces. Here's what I want us to catch. This isn't something that should be applauded in Gideon at this moment. Gideon had an angel of the Lord show up to him and say, I need you to do this thing for God. And God was patient with him and says, you know what? I'm going to be with you. And in the midst, as soon as it gets hard, Gideon goes, okay, hold on. Let me do a little test. Let's confirm this thing. For us to say, I'm going to put out my fleece is in essence saying, God, I want you to dot every I and cross every T before I'll take the first step. And I'm telling you, I've lived through that in my life where God was calling me to step off the sideline to do something. And I resisted until God started to answer my question. And I I don't look back on that moment and celebrate my obstinance. I actually look back on the moment and I grieve my lack of faith. But here's what I want us to catch, is that even though Gideon putting that out there showed a lack of faith, Gideon's test of God's call, it actually showed a lack of faith. In spite of that, God's still patient with him. And I can tell you God's been patient with me, and I'm pretty sure if we pass the mic this morning, many of us could share about how God has been patient with you too. So while we shouldn't celebrate the human action of Gideon in this moment, I think we should celebrate the patience of our God, but not put it to the test, not prevail upon it. And yet, God's patient. Gideon sees the signs that are there, and Gideon goes, all right, let's go to battle. So Gideon's ready for war. So the Midianite army has gathered in the valley. Gideon is ready to lead the people of Israel into battle. Remember, just a few days earlier, what is he doing? He's the lowest one on the rung in the weakest clan. He's the one doing the grunt work, and he's grumbling all the way. And now he's about to lead the people of Israel into battle. Look at chapter 7, verse 2. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. So, so Gideon goes out to war. The, the Midianite army is down in the valley and the people of Israel are starting to amass and 32,000 soldiers showed up. That's pretty exciting, right? There'd been a time when Gideon's down in the wine press hiding from the bully and now 32,000 people showed up. How do you think Gideon felt in that moment? 32,000 people are ready to go to war. Man, God is so good. Man, this is so exciting. Let's go to war. And then God goes, hey, hold on. You got way too many people here. I want you to make an announcement. If you're scared at all, if you need to change your shorts because you're nervous, right, go on home. 22,000 of them go, cool, I'm out. I get credit for coming, but then I get to go home too. 22,000 of them disappear and 10,000 are left. But God tells Gideon, hey, you still got too many at 10,000. Lest the people of Israel think they rescued themselves. So he tells him, hey, send those 10,000 men down to the river to get some water. And some of them are going to kneel down and use their hand to get some drink. And some of them are going to like go down on all fours and lap like a dog. And based on how they get water, I want you to call the crowd again. Look at verse 6. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was about 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his home. Now, this is not a prescription on how we're supposed to drink water, right? We shouldn't take that away from this one. Like, if you're a guy who kneels down and uses a hand, that's not what it's saying. What we're seeing is this, is that the army of 32,000 is now 300. How do you think Gideon felt as his army shrank before him? As another man grabs his bag and grabs his sword and says, he's got it. Frightened? Second guessing? Maybe. The Lord's accomplishing some powerful things, though in this process. The first thing is this. He's stacking the odds so so Israel can never assume that they saved themselves. He's stacking the odds so that if Israel is victorious in this endeavor, in this battle, 
that none of the Israelites can possibly say, we are amazing. Look how awesome our country is. Like the equivalent of USA, 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 right? Second thing is this, to teach Gideon to rely on the one who called him. So many times we get past that I am the least moment to step into God's call. And somewhere along the way, we convince ourselves that we're the key to success. Julie and I, we just spent time uh, a couple weekends back going up to South Carolina to spend time with family. And uh, while we were up there, or on the way up there, just the two of us in the car, we put on a podcast called The Rise and Fall of Marsville, talking about uh, Mark Driscoll, pastor and author, church out in Seattle, went from like people meeting in a living room to tens of thousands of people. And somewhere along the way, you can hear this pastor talking early on in the process and his, his hunger to hear God's word proclaimed and his, and his burden to see the lost saved. And it's this really beautiful, beautiful picture of what's going on. But somewhere along the story, it becomes like a Jerry Springer show of anger and resentment and pride and mistreatment and bullying and celebration of self. And even to the point where this pastor who God had used to grow this really cool thing, at least along some stages along the way, probably very early, was it cool at one point, comes this thing that's a hideous mess that looks nothing like the gospel. Why? Because somewhere along the line he convinced himself, I'm the one who's saving these people. And I'm the one who's building this church. And all of it came crumbling down. God is teaching Gideon, hey, you know what? you got to rely on me every step of the way. Whether you have 32,000 or 300, I'm still the key. Here's what I want you to catch. And this is something I need to remember. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. I don't take credit for that statement. I don't even remember who said the statement first. It's one of those things that's bounced around Christian circles enough to where, like, we don't even know who said it anymore, right? I'm sure somebody does. But the idea is this, is that we think God can't call us and we can't say yes until we've cleaned ourselves up enough and done enough to prepare ourselves, where now, okay, now I'm qualified. Now I can step in and say yes. That's the exact opposite of what we see the pattern of Scripture, that God doesn't call qualified people. He qualifies called people. And that qualifying process, that refining process, that making us more like Christ process, I'm going to tell you, it's often painful. It's often very painful. But those painful seasons where God is qualifying you and God is refining you are those ones that prepare you for God to use you to do great things. Remember, God in you is your most important qualification to do God's work. So here's this Gideon who's seeing this painful process of 32,000 people, 32,000 soldiers dwindling down to 300. So now what is he going to do? Well, Gideon and his 300 people, they went out to confront the Midianite army. And how in the world do 300 people defeat thousands upon thousands of Midianite soldiers? God's plan is not like this, you know, elite group of ninja warriors that are sneaking around in all black, you know, kung fu fighting everywhere. That's not God's plan. God's plan to set his people free comes down to pottery, trumpets, and torches. Look at verse 20. Then the three companies, he divided them up into three groups of 100, Then the three companies blew their trumpets, and they broke the jars, and they held in their left hands the torches, and in their right hands the trumpets they blew, and they cried out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. They cried out, and they fled. And when they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all of the army, and the army fled as far as... uh, that, that word and toward that word and as far as the border of those two words, right? And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from Manasseh and they pursued after Midian. What happens? Well, remember, the Midianite army is down in the valley and the people of Israel, this mighty army of 300 armed with torches and trumpets, right, are around on the hillside. And at Gideon's call, they break the jars that had been hiding their torches. That's what the pottery does. They shatter the pottery, their torches end up being visible, and they sound the trumpet, and the Midianite army down in the valley, they lose their minds. They come busting out of the tents, they've been asleep, they're completely disillusioned, they start fighting each other. The Israelite army is just standing up on the hill, blowing their trumpets and yelling, and the Midianite army is down fighting each other, and the 300 people, they end up chasing 
the Midianite army and the people of Israel are like coming out of their homes and joining the chase. 300 grows as they're going along and they end up defeating the Midianite army. Now, how big is this victory? Just catch this. Like for us to go 300 versus thousands, like, yeah, it's pretty cool, right? But the next chapter actually reveals that there were 120,000 Midianite soldiers down in that valley. And by God's miraculous deliverance, 300 men routed them. Now, let me say it differently. God routed them with 300 men. God used an unlikely nobody to do something unbelievable. And many of us, many of you, you look at God's big plan, you look in the mirror, and you assume you don't have an important role. Because when you look in the mirror, you don't see greatness. When you look to your past, you see far too many mistakes. And when you look to the future, you think maybe you're going to have a really, really quiet legacy that you're going to leave behind. You've assumed you don't have an important role to play in God's big plan. But I'm going to tell you if Christ is in you, you do. What is God calling you to do? Let me put it very simply. God is calling you to love him, to love others, and to love another. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love your neighbor as yourself and to love enough to share the good news with your neighbors in the nations. To take a, what, what does it look like to live out this call on God's life? This is your role. This is my role in God's big plan. We may have different titles assigned to us within that role, but every single person from the church attender to the leader of the largest church in the world, right? Their job all looks the same. Love God, love others, love enough. What does that look like? It means, it means to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow Jesus. It means to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And it means every Christ follower is called to love enough to share the good news of Jesus with the people that we know in our city and in our country and around the world in communities we may never even see. But God has called all of us to be a part of that. I will put to you that your mission and mine is bigger and more important than the mission of Gideon that night. Because ours is not just a temporary victory, that the people of Israel would slide back into another cycle of sin for another judge to have to come up. An important role, we look at it and go, that's amazing. I'm not sure I'm built for that, Kel. But you know what? We miss the fact that what God has called us to do, every Christ follower since he ascended to heaven and passed the baton of the good news to us, our mission is more important and more impactful than anything Gideon did that day. But in all of this, let's not forget. Remember, I started with this question. If you were writing a story of unusual greatness, who would be your star? Let me ask you, who's the star of today's story? Is it Gideon? No. Who delivered the people of Israel? It really wasn't Gideon. Can you say, like, dude, you're playing with the torches and trumpets? Awesome awesome military planning, right? They're going to teach this at West Point. No, it's not this, right? It is God delivering them in a miraculous way. God is the victor, and to the victor goes the glory. So remember, God used Gideon in spite of Gideon. Gideon believed the Lord had abandoned the people. Gideon believed he had nothing to contribute. Gideon struggled to even take God at his word. And yet Gideon's story stands as a testimony to one type of the reclamation projects that God wants to do in your life and mine. You see, in Hebrews chapter 11, if we fast forward way into the New Testament, thousands of years after Gideon would have lived, right? Gideon is listed in Hebrews 11, which is called the Great Hall of Faith where the writer of Hebrews is recounting the people, the unlikely people that God had used to do unbelievable things, the Abrahams and the Moses and people that had done incredibly powerful things, right? Gideon, this unknown nobody who's the least in his clan, Gideon is listed in between King David and Samson. Isn't that incredible? Gideon the least is remembered as Gideon the faithful, but there was a point when he believed that you had to be great to leave a great legacy. We can make the same mistake. In God's economy, the impact of our lives is not dependent upon the size of our skill set or the power of our personality. We live in a culture that celebrates those two things, that elevates those two things, that when people are successful, we, we look to them and we say, well, of course they're successful. Look at how talented they are. 
Look at how many resources they had at their disposal. And then we look at our lives and we go, who am I? I'm the least. But in God's economy, that is the prerequisite to being used by God in in a mighty way. Paul said, when I am weak, I am strong. And we look in the mirror and we go, I'm the least, I can't do it. God goes, perfect, let's get started. Great legacies are left by ordinary people who trust and obey our extraordinary God. Is God going to use you to defeat an army? Probably not. Is God going to use you to write a book of the Bible? No, that's all done. Is God going to use you to to write books that impact millions? Maybe. Is God going to use you to make a difference leading a church? Possibly. But I can say without, without any hesitation that if Christ is in you, God wants to use you to impact your home. God wants to use you to impact your spouse. God wants to use you to share the good news with your children and maybe even with your parents. God wants to use you to, to, to make a difference in the lives of the people you interact with in our community, whether it's at your kids' soccer games or the people in the next cubicle or the people who sit next to you in math class or the people who drive you crazy in your neighborhood. God wants to use you to make himself known to, the, to your neighbors and to the nation. And that's the most important thing you will ever do. Your resume is a mile long, filled with accomplishments and measurables, metrics that anybody who was looking to hire you would be blown away by. If you knock all those things out of, the, out of the park, and yet when it comes to God's big story, you go, I'm the least and I don't have what it takes, and you decide to sit on the sidelines, then your life is nothing more than a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal because you did not live in love. I ask you today, will you respond to God's call in your life? Not grumbling about the way things are around you like Gideon did. Not grumbling about your country like Gideon is. Uh, Not looking to put out fleeces to confirm God's call on your life. Will you simply pray to God today, Lord, I believe you can do extraordinary things through ordinary people. Lord, I believe you have called me to know Christ and to make Christ known. Lord, I believe you have called me to love you, to love others, and to love enough. God, I believe You can make me your reclamation project. Imagine a church where everyone who was there looked in the mirror and said, I am the least, but I'm going to pour out my life in service of the most. What would your family look like? What would your workplace look like? What would your neighborhood look like? What would our country look like? And the world look like if a people said, God, I believe you can do great things, even through these people. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you. I'm blown away by the fact that the one who holds the universe in the palm of his hand, he looks at flawed, finite people like us, and and you invite us into your work. I don't understand that sometimes. And yet I delight in being a part of the family business, in being a part of what my heavenly father longs to do, to make make his glory known to the nation, to extend it to everyone who doesn't know you. Lord, forgive us for our small vision. Lord, forgive us for being willing to cling to the comfort zone on the sideline. Lord, forgive us for believing we're the least and thinking that disqualifies. Lord, your word is so clear that when we are weak, we delight in our weakness. And when we are weak, we are strong because it's you who can shine in us. Lord, we are unlikely people filled with mistakes and sins in our past, incomplete in our skill sets and our powers of persuasion. We don't have what it takes to be the people you've called us to be. And us grasping that and holding on to that is the key. So, Lord, if there's anyone here today who's never surrendered to you as Lord and Savior, who is trying to live life on their own, is looking at themselves in the mirror and believing they have to build a great legacy, Lord, I pray you'd wipe all that away and call them to salvation today. 
And Lord, for those of us who are following you, if there's any of us who have been content to know what our eternity looks like, but content to wait for that and not work toward that, Lord, forgive us and call us to something greater. Lord, I long to see Good Life Church be packed with people, not only who are living out the mission of God, who are pouring out their lives to make Christ known across the street and around the world, but Lord, for this church to be filled with the fruit of that work. Lost people who are found, struggling people who are saved, broken people who are made new in Christ, and that this church is not full of transfers, Lord, but new converts, that the family of God is growing because the people of God are diving into the family business. Lord, let us not be content with less. Let us long. Let us long for more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, Good Life family. We are so thankful to have you here today. And one last time as we're signing off of the service today, I want to quickly remind you of how we can share life together as a church family. If God was stirring something in your heart and you want to know more about your next steps, in following Jesus, we'd invite you to email us at info at goodlifefl.com. Or if you just have questions about our church family or want to know more about us here at Good Life, you can always visit our website, goodlifefl.com. In addition, throughout the week, you can find us on social media, on Facebook, as well as Instagram. And right here in this room where I'm standing, we'll gather every Sunday, 930 and 11. In addition, this online service goes up at 11 o'clock. also want to make sure that you're aware of our Christmas Eve service. We'll be meeting here at Good Life, but we're going to be doing it outside, kind of in this field north of our parking lot here at Good Life. I want to encourage you to do that Christmas Eve, 4 o'clock. We're going to be gathering and celebrating together, and you are invited no matter where you're joining us from. And other than that, we're so thankful for you. We're excited to gather again right back here next Sunday. And until then, let's continue to be a people who love enough to share in the good news of Jesus and to share our lives as well.